Before we get to the movie, I want to talk about Rick Springfield. The sexier Eddie Money, the edgier Richard Marks. Do you remember his song, Bop Till You Drop? Yes, I do. Do you remember the video? Yeah, it was some creepy post-apocalyptic in the wasteland, but we're rocking out type video. Yeah, that was the first thing ever directed by David Fincher. Oh, really? Tona's Uncle Brad is in that video, <laughs> and he is prominently featured. You can see him right here. He's this nervous man. He's playing some sort of flute. And then this mean man doesn't like that one bit, and he hits him with a blast, and that's all for Uncle Brad. But I bet that inspires Rick Springfield to start the rebellion. By bopping. This means something very important. Tona is one degree of separation from David Fincher and Rick Springfield. I've got a bunch of movies that I've never seen before. You don't know what they are. Every episode, I'm going to spring one on you. It might be good. It might be bad. We'll watch it and talk about it. Welcome to The Basement. You're probably wondering why I'm dressed this way. You're doing One Flew of the Cougar's Nest cosplay. <laughs> For those of you who are wondering, I'm also dressed in my pajamas. It's because tonight's movie, the first of Cartoon June, is sort of a bedtime story. And it's the only feature-length animated film we've ever watched from the 1930s. I hope your bags are packed, because you're about to set sail on Gulliver's Travels. Oh, well, come on over here, Gulliver. Released in 1939, Gulliver's Travels was produced by Max Fleischer for Fleischer Studios and directed by Dave Fleischer. It stars Sam Parker, Pinto Kolvig, Livonia Warren, and Cal Howard. Gulliver's Travels was actually the second ever animated feature film by an American studio, after Disney's Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. The songs were written by Gentlemen Prefer Blonde's lyricist and basement alum Leo Robin. Robin, Robin, who knows? Robin, Robin, Robin. The film was Oscar nominated for Best Original Score and Best Song, but lost in both categories to a little movie called The Wizard of Oz. Oh, all right. I've heard, I've seen, I think I've seen that. What do you think? Are you ready for adventure? There's the question of how far into Gulliver's Travels will this go? You've read the book. I started to read the book. How far into Gulliver's Travels did I go? It's a, it's a big book. No, no, I just got tired of it. Oh, okay. It's an 18th century satire, you know. <laughs> you're like, oh, I see what he's saying about George II. <laughs> like Gulliver, your gift tonight is another giant that once roamed the seven seas. It's a plesiosaurus that I can make myself. You can assemble have... it with your sons. Man, again, you know my children. This will not go well. Well, step on board the gangplank as we weigh anchor on the old leather couch and get ready to embark on Gulliver's Travels. Liver. Liver, yes. In Tetchnicolor, 1939, the world braces for war. And here's about a story about a really tall guy. Lemuel Gulliver. Lemuel. Lemuel Gulliver is out in a boat. But not for long. He is buffeted by a storm. The boat is quickly blasted to pieces. He drowns for a little bit in the ocean. And finds his way to land. How do you like your travels so far, Gulliver? Exhausted, he falls into a deep sleep. He's got one pants leg rolled up. He's going to ride a bike. <laughs> This little troll is named Gabby. He is a high-strung, cranky sort. He's the night watchman of his kingdom of Lilliput. And all's well, what's a rainy day? Never mind that cloud behind that. And that it's clearly night. There's a giant! All's not well, it's such a crappy day. There is a giant on the beach and he won't go away. Our life has become hell. We're all going away. We're gonna lose all of our food because he'll eat one thing. And he freaks out. He starts back to town like a rocket man. Sloth! <laughs> he goes to try and see the king. Now, the king currently is in negotiations with King Bombo, who's the king of Blefiscu, a neighboring kingdom. They're negotiating a wedding between Prince David and Princess Glory. It's going to unite their two countries. Both kings are excited. 
Wow, those two are getting it on. Does it give you any ideas? Well, we did it, you little rascal, you. We did it. Ha, we're watching it. <laughs> Buddy. Oh, Adolf Hitler, you get out of here. Bumbo and little R loving this whole marriage thing. They look at the flowers and they look at the ring. Is this from Zales? Oh, my, my, look at the cake. How about the wedding song? Well, it's got to be the song of Bluffescu forever. Sung at every single wedding in our kingdom. No, but we always sing faithful at our weddings. Bombo says, what? And Little says, that. Marriage is off, as you might imagine. King Bombo declares war on Lilliput. Gabby finally gets to see the king, tells the king, there's a giant on the beach. We have to deal with it. It takes a lot longer for him to tell these things because they have to be all about everything. That is a sword between his legs, right? <laughs> I hope so. Forever. Oh, my love, you're singing so bland. So technically good. There's a giant on the beach! There's a giant on the beach! By now, the giant has turned into a skeleton because it's been so long. <laughs> Gabby goes out and rings the town bell, and he tells everyone about the situation. They all get their torches and their tools, and they go down to the beach. Meanwhile, there's spies. King Bongo's... Bombo, King Bombo's spies are snooping around. Do, 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 do. Bink. Okay, this gang, they go down to the beach. The giant is so big that they don't even know that they're standing on his body. And they laugh at Gabby. They say, there's no giant. Stupid. Why is the ground thumping? We're on the giant. Oi! Told you that there was a giant on the beach. You b -b 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 bastards. We got some work to do this massive bit of engineering. First, they have to tie up the giant. Just drop that hand into this giant bowl of water and we'll get to see a funny thing. Make sure the water's warm. And then they construct this giant wagon. They hoist his body up, put him on the wagon. Offset below. Okay. <laughs> and they wheel him to town so the king can see him. This is much more efficient than just bringing the king down to the beach. Well, where is he? The better question is, where isn't he? That's how big he is. <laughs> he can be seen from space. Oh, he's got all this interesting stuff. Look at this watch. Oh, now they're in the neutral zone. <laughs> Look at this gun. The gun goes off. It's very destructive. It might make a return appearance to the story. This Russian playwright told me all about that. Gulliver wakes up. Those little ropes can't hold him. He just rips right out of them. Let it go. Help! Help! Let it go. Oh. A Let man. Go. A tiny Help. man. Go. Bo -bo -bo. Who are you? I'm king around here. Well, king? Well, I, well, I didn't uh, even know that that was what you were going to say. It's at this point that King Bombo's forces attack from the sea. The Armada. Bombo's... Blue Flisky Armada. <laughs> but Lilliput now has this gentle giant. Get him, Gulliver. Smash them. Smash their tiny bodies. What the hell is that? They get one look at him and they turn tail and run. Don't worry about me, little guys. A bo -bo 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 -bo. <laughs> yeah. This is no way to treat a harmless visitor. Gulliver's clearly concussed. <laughs> He just seems dazed. At your service. Can you fight? I can lick anybody my size. And I have. And that's how I got all those viruses. <laughs> stomp, stomp, stomp. Stomp, stomp, stomp. Why don't you make me some clothes? <laughs> this doesn't remind me of any song about working and whistling from some other cartoon. It's a hap hap happy day in Lilliput as they give Gulliver a new outfit. They groom him, they shave him. Now, build me a house. Back in King Bombo's palace, he's upset. He gives a message to this dumb bird. It is up to you to carry this message to my spies. Oh no, 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 no. <laughs> oh, nope. Tell the spies they need to get rid of that giant. This bird is the ancestor of so many other cartoon birds. There's a huge banquet. <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> the spies are watching from the top of a nearby building. There's a whole lot of boing in this movie. None of it sexual. Who wins the one for us? You! It's what you've done for us. There is a man. A certain man. A man whose size that we all prize in Lilliput land. Well, Gulliver, I've suddenly become quite romantically attached to your hand. Perhaps I could take your hand in marriage. <laughs> The spies get an idea. We're gonna take that gun, Gulliver's Thunder Machine. To the ladies, Gulliver's Thunder Machine is something quite different. The tool of his own destruction. Yeah, put one in the brain, as they do in Blufusku. Blufusku. As they do in Blufusku. It's nighttime. Gulliver goes out to the seashore. Gulliver sings a sad little song. We're trying to sleep! <laughs> Windows are shattering. Yeah. Everyone's awake. Let's see, if I made two of these, I could skate home. <laughs> my, my. My, my. My, my, my. The spies, they are trying to figure out how to use a machine. You put that ball in there. And then pull the string! <laughs> The movie was supposed to be about me, and then he showed up. <laughs> the prince returns. He's too much in love with Princess Glory, and he doesn't care that they're at war. Gabby and the guards see him, and there's a sword fight. Gabby gets involved, comically. Gulliver sees what's going on, and he rescues the prince and the princess, and takes them off to some place where they can be together. Guess which hand the corpse is in. You guessed it. Still alive. Aww. My, my, my. Gabby intercepts the bird's message, and he knows that the other country is going to attack them. Does this man ever sleep? That Lilliputian crank must be some really powerful stuff. <laughs> they prepare for battle. Gulliver, we need you. Where you been, you lazy, long-legged, overgrown lemmas? I think I hate Gabby. <laughs> is that wrong? And they start firing... They're salvos, and Gulliver says, why, what's going on? I, I don't know why this even has to happen. He picks up all their ropes, and he pulls them into the shore. Then they roll out the gun to a precipice where they think they might be able to get old Gulliver. Gulliver, you're about to get got. Gulliver's thunder machine. Someone should tell him to zip up his pants. The guys are trying to load up the gun, but they're those funny types of spies. So it takes them a while. Pulling back the trigger. The hammer on is getting farther and farther back, and they're going to pull the trigger. And David gets there right in time. The shot goes wild. Gulliver is saved. Lucky they were so wacky. You see what you've all done? What is this whole stupid war has been about? A song? Petty things don't matter, because love is what matters. Oh, we're so sorry. Why can't they sing both songs at the same time? Forever. Thereby creating a new awards-worthy song that will satisfy both countries. And the princess and the prince sing faithful forever. Whatever you do, Gulliver, don't start applauding them. Take the rest of our trees, build a boat, and get out of here! Thank you, everyone, for letting me exploit your resources. More Gulliver-sized people shall follow. And he sails off for the continuation of Gulliver's travels. See you around, Lemuel! <laughs> Gulliver's travels. Gulliver's travel. Yeah. He goes to one place in this thing. I haven't seen other Gulliver Travels movies. I don't know if they ever do do the one where... He goes to the island where he's the little person yeah. and goes on adventures that way and encounters a cat. And how does he get out of that situation? There's an island of horse people. <laughs> and then there is the island of yahoos, which is where we get the word yahoo from. Huh. They're like just idiot people. And they're basically us. I was disappointed in the story. 
because the movie's just not about anything. Like the story is just whisper thin. And Gulliver is so dull. He doesn't have to be interesting because he is huge. If the movie's called Gulliver's Travels, the character Gulliver needs to be somewhat interesting. <laughs> My problem wasn't with him. It was with basically everyone else. Yeah. He went to an island of cartoon characters and Fleischer cartoon characters. Big shiny noses. Yeah, so broad and... <laughs> and that we focus so much on Gabby and King Little. They were so unappealing both physically and also vocally. And personality-wise. Yeah, their voices. Gabby, you couldn't understand anything he was saying. And then you had King Little. I don't know who thought, how about we get some... Just basically talks like this. War isn't nice. Or the enemy with patient. For a voice artist on a cartoon. The action is constantly so frantic that it takes so long for anyone to do anything. Looking at flowers, they look at the flowers and they look at each other and they point at the flowers and they smell the flowers and they look at each other and they nod and they look at the flowers. <laughs> Just like enough with the flowers. Mm -hmm. The civil engineering project of ensnaring Gulliver, that is a scene that can take its time. That could have been the whole movie and it was glorious to watch. And the movie sucked for the first 20 minutes and then they started wrapping up Gulliver. That's why this movie exists and why it exists in cartoon form. The book came out in, what, 1750 or whatever. It took them nearly 200 years to get the technology to actually show the story. You couldn't do this as a play or an opera. You couldn't do this as a live action film, back then at least. It took cartoons to make it possible. And so that's what makes this cartoon so important. And whenever it was anything, that was the contrast of Gulliver with the Lilliputians. Like the little dancing scene with the king and, and Gulliver's hand. That's wonderful. The way that the characters interacted with objects was usually the, the source of the best animation. When they're going over the bridge and we see the shifting boards and the yeah. light that comes through. Mm -hmm. Like, that's, that's so well done. But the characters are just these little gnomes yeah. who are not pleasant to look at or listen to. Also, what's lacking from this movie is the satire of Jonathan Swift. All the islands that Gulliver goes to is a different facet of humanity or something that humanity is lacking. And I didn't get any form of satire other than people go to war for the silliest reasons and 1939 isn't the year to make a movie about how people go to war for the silliest reasons. This is our second kaiju film of the year. Well, we had Godzilla earlier this year. Now we get Gulliverzilla. We hope you enjoyed Gulliver's Travels, and now it's time for us to find out what adventures await us in Seen It. Seen It! Emily Binder. I finally saw Blues Brothers. It was okay. The music, of course, was amazing, but the movie itself was admittedly a little boring for me. Boring? Boring? If you asked me to give you an example of a not boring movie, <laughs> I would say either The Blues Brothers or Mad Max Fury Road. <laughs> And they both have roughly the same amount of smash vehicles, I'd say. Yeah. I think the reason why the Blues Brothers is probably the best SNL movie, and probably will remain so, is because those characters didn't come from sketches. They weren't even characters. They didn't have an identity before the movie, so the movie is able to approach them from a blank slate and mm -hmm. really create this kind of mythological duo. And who were also blank slates. They were uniform in style. You only get to see one of their eyes ever. That really makes the movie intriguing to mm -hmm. watch. Like, who are these guys? What are they all about? Why does Carrie Fisher keep trying to kill them? Yeah. And they almost have supernatural powers. A man who's that tubby can't do that many backflips in a row. No. But you believe it when you're watching the movie. Sure. And the only acting performance of Sir Steven Spielberg. <laughs> That's right, he's the clerk. Sean Henry writes, Robert Montgomery's New Mexico Noir Ride the Pink Horse. Seen it. Seen it. I like to eat with my hands. I get closer to the food that way. <laughs> it's a film noir movie that just does everything backwards. Almost seems like a western that this guy with a fedora shows up in. And the hero of this movie, he gets shot like two-thirds of the way through and he spends the last third of the movie just on the run and just like sweating and desperate and being helped by the people that you'd think he'd be helping. It's very similar to Odd Man Out, I think it is. Uh, Carol Reed. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Although he gets shot like 
ten minutes into the movie. Right. Yeah, he's he's, <clears throat> he's dying the entire movie. You show up for this film noir, but it really is about this young Mexican girl who finds the power of friendship. <laughs> also, for a film noir, it's called Ride the Pink Horse. That's just really weird. It's really weird that a black and white movie has any color in the title. Yes, exactly. Unless it's black. Right. Or white. Or gray. Yes. Yeah, and Lucky Gagan is such a weird hero. He's so weasely and mean. Mm -hmm. He's a, it's it's an, uh, like you say, it's backwards. Yeah. Sean Gilliam, The Vast of Night. Seen it. Seen it. I just saw this yesterday. Did you like it? Yeah, I did. I started out hating it. How did that turn around? I realized I was in the middle of a nine minute long shot of a girl talking on the phone and I was just... <laughs> amazed that I was just so entranced by it. This is a very strange film. It takes place in the 50s, and it's these two high school kids who discover that there are weird noises happening, and they're picking them up on their radios, and it might be coming from space. And the main character's name is Everett Sloan. Mm -hmm. The call letters of his radio station, WOTW, this is New Mexico, it should be K-something, but WOTW is War of the Worlds. Oh. I haven't seen a movie that takes place in the 50s that has been this free of anachronism. I mean, it was so authentic. The dialogue was so authentic. At one point, she says connection issues, and that seems a little too modern. But she's also a switchboard operator. They might have actually said that back then. Yeah, this was an AV club nerd dream. <laughs> yeah, really? It's like, we're going to go to the real to real. <laughs> and we're like, well, damn, flip this. Is it possibly a ham radio operator? <laughs> the only thing about it that I... Not that I didn't like, but it kind of doesn't have an ending. No, it doesn't. But it's not really a story so much as this experience and, and getting sucked into this mystery. Ben Morozuk writes, Can you guys talk about Blue Velvet? I know you've mentioned it briefly in the past, but since it's one of Craig's perennial favorites, I'd love to hear an in-depth discussion of your opinions on it and your experiences watching it. Well, I've seen it. I just watched it again recently for the first time since high school. You would say that this is David Lynch's best movie? Mm -hmm. No big shocker there. I think I know why. Okay. I think it's his least weird movie, even though it's weird as hell. The plot makes total sense. There's no lapses in reality. And I think it's his most clearly conceived and executed premise. This movie has a very simple elevator pitch. The Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew, but really dark. And erotic. <laughs> right. How I see David Lynch's career is that he has his dream stories, which would be my Mulholland Drive and Lost Highway and Twin Peaks Fire Walks With Me, and his straight stories, which would be Straight Story, Elephant Man, uh, Twin Peaks, a TV show. And I see that Blue Velvet is the bridge okay. between the two. Frank Booth. How does that guy even live in the world? What happens when he has to go to the DMV? <laughs> he doesn't what, go to the what, DMV. What happens when he goes to, to the pharmacy to get cough syrup? I mean, <laughs> it's, every interaction that he has has to be, you know, he, he, the guy would be locked up. Yeah, that's true, but he's got flunkies. You just, Other people get you cough syrup. You sit at home and huff the thing and yeah. you scream at the walls and that's mm -hmm. it. Well, you can take a little cyber voyage on over to our website, welcometothebasementshow.com, where all of our episodes live. They're all great. All of them. And there are also PayPal donation buttons that you can click on to donate to help support this show with a one-time or rolling monthly donation. And people do that. People like this person. Lisa! I just made a donation in honor of my husband's 41st birthday. He introduced her to our show, and they watch it together. Please give a shout-out and thumb kiss to Hugh, who is just getting over COVID and pneumonia. Oh, Man. Hugh. Hope you're feeling better, yes. buddy. Mwah. Welcome back to the world. You can also watch us open our mail and do other fun things on the Unboxing Show, which comes out this coming Friday. Yes, it does. My, my, my. That was Gulliver's Travels. And now you can watch this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Watch it, watch it, watch it. Don't get up yet. I know, I know, I know. I'm just stretching. Don't stretch. Don't stretch. <laughs> Thank you. All right. My, my, my.